Joining us from Tel Aviv is an Israeli commentator and the country's former ambassador to Mauritania, Boaz Bismuth. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. According to the pre-election polls, this was going to be a very tight race, but in the end, it really wasn't, was it? To what do you attribute Likud's victory in this election? Well, I think, first of all, th that, I mean, th the results we had yesterday uh, showed how much, I mean, commentators, how much journalists, how much, I mean, polls, experts, I mean, missed the story. And the story was that the Likud party and Benjamin Netanyahu had great support for the people. Uh, yet, at the same time, one mustn't uh, forget that only last week, I mean, Thursday, I mean, the polls were giving, it was like minus five, minus five points in the polls. So two questions we can ask. One is how come, I mean, the Israeli experts in elections, I mean, didn't see how this, how would I say, this invasion towards Netanyahu. And the second question one might ask is what happened in the last week. So first of all, concerning the first part, I would say that in Israel right now you do have, I would say, wishful thinking commentators. I mean, who would give you an analysis of what is happening according to their will or desire. That is the first point. Now, concerning the second point, concerning what has happened the last week, well, I would say that, I mean, I would say that some of the right-wing voters were a little bit asleep or were intending to give their votes to other right-wing parties. And I think that when Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, has told them that he's really, I mean, in danger of losing, well, they were succeeded in mobilizing them. Now, if you'll permit me only to add one more thing concerning the result, and that is really important in order to understand those elections in Israel. I mean, again and again and again, we see how the uh, 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 Labour Party, which changed its name this, this time to the uh, Zionist Union, how would I say, tried again to bring up internal issues, economical issues, social issues. Netanyahu, on the contrary, was talking again on, uh, how would I say, on the threats towards Israel from uh, uh, ISIS, from, of course, Iran, from the weak agree agreement one might sign the 5 plus 1 with Iran. And I do think that, again, it has proven, it has shown how much Israelis think or care, first of all, uh, for their safety before peace and before social care. Right. So you're saying, then, that this election was won on security issues, not on domestic economic issues. Yes, but at the same time, at the same time, and I'm not contradicting myself, but I do believe it's not because that was the main issue uh, that that Prime Minister Netanyahu put on the table and that the Israeli uh, voters, uh, uh, I mean, uh, put emphasize that the other issues are not uh, important. One must know that in Israel, I mean, one has to work really, really, really hard nowadays and the cost of, of living is really high. If you would compare it to European countries, for example, you would see that when you go to the supermarket, uh, the prices are really, really high and the salary is not as high as in Europe, which is something that really Israelis, I mean, uh, uh, do try, do complain about. Also, another issue is the, uh, uh, buying an apartment, which has become like almost part of science fiction for many, many young Israelis right now. Now, let's be honest. This is a worldwide problem. This is not only an Israeli problem. Yet, at the same time, I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu has understood perfectly that maybe he got votes from the Israelis for their security, yet at the same time, they expect him to deal also on, how would I say, on maybe making their life easier and uh, making uh, li everyday life uh, much more pleasant. Looking at how the votes may have shifted in the final days before the election, uh, or how people may have changed their allegiances, the New York Times says Prime Minister Netanyahu resorted to fear-mongering and anti-Arab attacks in those final days. To what extent do you think that pushed those undecided voters, wavering voters, into Netanyahu's camp? Mm -hmm. So I must be honest and to, to tell you, sir, that this uh, remark uh, I heard uh, a lot uh, uh, today while giving a few interviews uh, to worldwide media. And I will tell you one thing. I think that did not determine, I mean, the vote of the Israelis, but it is a fact that Prime Minister Netanyahu has said what he said. And of course, even in Israel, among uh, left-wing voters, I mean, this was something that uh, disturbed them. Now, if you look, one has to see uh, this point in a broader way. Uh, uh, the Arab Party, which today is, uh, has 14 uh, uh, members in uh, Parliament, which are, makes them number three, the number three party, by the way, uh, which coincides with the accusation that Israel is an apartheid country. How can you be an apartheid country and have a party, uh, the number three in the Parliament, which is an Arab Party, and by the way, I must add, an anti-Zionist, most of them, uh, in the Knesset, which proves you how much open-minded Israelis are. Now, when Prime Minister Netanyahu says what he says, you have to put in parallel that this 
this party also, many members of that party, the Arab party has in it secular, Arab, secular, but you'll have also Islamist, communist, in order to go to the Knesset, they all join together. And I believe that one of the reasons why Prime Minister Netanyahu has said what he said, because he knows, he knows the ideological gap between Israelis and even between uh, members of the Knesset and the Arab party. Where does this leave the Israeli left right now? Is there a likelihood that they could be part of a coalition government, a national unity government? There has been talk of that. Or, they, uh, or are they now effectively in the political wilderness? First of all, we have also a president in Israel, President Rivlin, and what he really wants is to see, I mean, the two parties, uh, uh, the Likud and the Labour Party, together, joining together. That is what, a, a big coalition. That's his desire, and I think he will work uh, for it. Uh, the question is, I mean, does the Labour Party wishes to join Benjamin Netanyahu's government? Because today one thing is sure, he does not need them in order to form a government. He's got enough. I mean, I would say if I make a simple calculation, he's got already 61 members of Knesset, he's got a majority, and past has proven that you can work and handle a government with only a majority of one uh, uh, member of, parliament, of uh, Knesset. And by the way, if you permit me just one remark, the uh, former government you had, I mean, look what a big government we had, look what a big coalition we had, and it did not work. There was a paralysis. So one can say that on the contrary, maybe with a small uh, coalition, but very clear, uh, uh, very, how would I say, uh, uh, ideologically, uh, things the same, on the contrary, this might work. Ambassador, the big news that was reported all over the world, especially here in the United States, just before the election, was Prime Minister Netanyahu's statement that if he is re-elected, there will not be a two-state solution. The Palestinians will not have their state. Is the two-state solution now effectively off the table? Is it dead? Now, he said what he said yesterday, I think, and that was something in order to attract also voters. So I think that if the occasion comes, if really Abu Mazen will be serious for once, if really it will be, it will be clear with whom you're talking among the Palestinians, if it's Hamas, if it's uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, if, for example, Abu Mazen for once will have also his speech, let's say Birzeit speech, for example, where he'll recognize the, 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 how would I say, the Jews uh, to be able to also have the right to a Jewish state, maybe this will make him, Netanyahu, also come back again to his speech in 2009. For the time being, I think Netanyahu sees that, first of all, Israelis, I mean, really, I mean, do not believe right now in negotiations anymore. I mean, they are very much disappointed. By the way, in the campaign, we did not mention, or you didn't hear a lot, the peace uh, negotiations or peace treaty with the Palestinians. You did not hear that, not only from left wing, uh, right wing, but also from left wing. But again, now, this is something, let's for not forget one thing. There, is, there are things, there are statements one makes uh, during a campaign, and there is afterwards a reality. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, on his fourth government that is forming, right. I think that he knows that reality so, sometimes so uh, uh, makes you do things that you don't uh, uh, really, really uh, so say during a campaign. If, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that that, that policy, that uh, statement that he made, could change. Uh, the United States, uh, you know, its allies around the world, including the United States, have all been supporting and advocating the two-state solution. If Israel does not, it rejects that, is it oh. going to isolate Israel even further? I do believe, I do believe. First of all, it is true what you say. I mean, Washington wants a two-state solution. The European Union, the Arab League, the African Union, that is, of course, that is totally correct. But do the Palestinians really want a two-state solution? Are they really serious, I mean, for once and for all, to finish, I mean, with this negotiation? I mean, look, ever since we started negotiating, ever since this conflict has started in 19, 1948, look how many conflicts in the world have been solved. Look how many conflicts. So I think that if we start again and again by blaming Israel, we'll get to nothing. One final foreign policy issue, and that is the current negotiations taking place between uh, the United States and its uh, European allies, as well as Russia uh, and China, uh, the P5 plus 1 negotiations with Iran. Is the outcome of this election going to influence that in any way, in your view? Look, we know uh, perfectly well, I mean, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, point of view, uh, 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 concerning the 5 plus 1 uh, and Iran uh, nuclear negotiations that have started again in Geneva in 2009. I think that the way those negotiations have started, look, I covered them, I, I, I covered most of them and I know them from near. I think that what uh, the aspiration at the beginning of the 5 plus 1 and the deal, the weak deal we're going to get now, uh, that is something that is really threatening Netanyahu. Don't forget one thing. I mean, you're sitting right now, you're interviewing for me from, from D.C. And in D.C., this is a social, social, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is a security, national security matter. For Israel, 
well, this is an existential matter. Don't forget another thing. Iranians, when they have their missiles, when they produce their missiles, when they write on their missiles, they don't write destination Paris or London or Mumbai or uh, uh, New York, God forbid. It's written Tel Aviv. It's written uh, Jerusalem. It's written Israel. And that is why Israel are really worrying. Another thing we, one mustn't forget, we're dealing here with the Mullahs. We're dealing here with a state that is supporting terrorism. We're not dealing here with a normal state. This is totally, I mean, a country that no one would uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, trust. And we are talking about permitting, permitting an Islamic Republic of Iran, we're permitting mullahs enriching uranium. What are we really talking about? Are we serious? Ambassador Baez Bismuth, thanks for joining us, sir.